the number one selling hip hop artist of all time is a white guy from the middle of the country. While Eminem found his fame and created his name in Detroit, Marshall Mathers came out of Kansas and lived as a boy in Kansas City, Missouri. Eminem's rise helped give birth to a new American dream. One lived out to the hilt by a heartland gangster. A lot of times people would try to get over on him because they see him and they think he's a white boy. That's what they would say, who's the white guy? He wasn't white, he's Colombian. This is my mother brother, Lulu. Did you hear me, brother? See the resemblance? His rapper friends knew him as Lulu. Federal authorities called his act the perfect storm on Kansas City. This middle America tale of cocaine, murder, Mexican cartels, and gangster rap went largely unreported until two enterprising young crime reporters stumbled onto it. We were trying to find evidence of Mexican drug cartels being in Kansas City. I just basically Googled Kansas City drug cartel, and I found a, a short brief in the Kansas City Star that had been run when Corridor was indicted. They found a gold mine. Both Ian Cummings and Chris Hong were still in college. Cummings was a graduate student at the University of Kansas, where Chris Hong was a senior. Both of us, you know, really into crime dramas, like shows like The Wire. And then all of a sudden, before we have a full-time job, we stumble upon a real-life case of the exact same drug activity methods that, you know, you see on TV and in the movies all the time. You know, it was a uh, crash course in journalism as well. I'd also just started using PACER, which is, you know, the federal government. Uh, filing system, so I searched Alejandro Cordor on PACER, and all the transcripts and the documents were right there. You're talking about a guy who was, you know, one of the bigger drug dealers ever arrested, from what the prosecutors were telling us. I mean, it's not every day you'd imagine this guy could be, you know, living right next door to you. And then there was the murder, and I think that's really when it sunk in, and we were like, well, we're on to something. Hung and Cummings helped inform their community about a gangster's influence in middle America. Those who knew Lulu Corridor say at the time of his arrest, he was on the verge of a fresh start. I think he clung to the music. He wanted this to be successful. He put more than just money into it. Block Life was the absolute legitimate dream of his and theirs. They had just signed a contract with Universal about six months before they were indicted. Alejandro Corridor was a not so silent partner in Block Life a Kansas City rap group on the rise. Lulu was the main investor in their music. It was the perfect storm in that he spoke fluent Spanish. He could deal directly with the sources of supply for the illegal drugs. And then on the other side, he had established this relationship with a hip hop group. So he has both the ability to import the cocaine and the ability to push it out to the street. By 2006, Jones and Westbrook had released their debut album, Bleed the Block, financed in part by Corridor. He provided money. He helped set up concert dates. We was pretty much 50-50. Like, what we couldn't cover on our end, he would. One house off 95th was his that we all stayed at. And that's when the first album came out. That's where we all hung out. That was one of his properties. We ended up doing a search warrant on the house. There were guns in almost every room in the house, marijuana, a little bit of cocaine, some ecstasy pills, and $12,000 cash. At that point, that piqued my interest as, hey, who is this guy, you know? Federal agents were tipped off to the source of Lulu's drug supply when he got sloppy with his trash. 
there was what we call a trash pull or a trash recovery where we just pick up the trash in front of your house. They pulled the trash from one of the houses Corridor owned in Kansas City and found wire transfers to Mexico. He got cocaine from the Mexicans, supplied it to his associates at Block Life Entertainment. They converted it into crack cocaine and distributed it on the streets. By 2008, federal agents had enough evidence to petition the Department of Justice for permission to start wiretaps against Corridor and his associates. The Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and the DEA, special agents with Homeland Security Investigations, opened up Operation Blockbuster against Alejandro Corridor. It led to wiretaps on his communications and GPS tracking devices on his vehicles. That opened up a lot of avenues for the case because we could follow him. They quickly discovered the scope of his operation. A lot of these guys, they will limit what they say on the phone. But with Corridor, the problem for him is he's talking to Blanco down in Mexico, and everything was out in the open. Flaco was Corridor's direct connection to the Sinaloa cartel, his cocaine hookup. May 2009. He received a call from Flaco, the Sinaloa cartel, and said they had a large amount of a special, a higher grade of marijuana that was stolen. And uh, they wanted to find out who stole it. Corridor found a guy named Stephen James allegedly selling the same type of high-grade marijuana. So Corridor told Flacco, well, I found this guy. It's someone I know. Um, what would you like me to do about this? And, and he was asked to, to get the marijuana back or get payment for it. Now, Stephen James is my cousin. And Alejandro wanted me to basically take care of that for him. And with him being my cousin, I basically gave my cousin a heads up. Well, Stephen James apparently wasn't willing to cooperate, so Flacco said, well, he needs to be killed. So the next thing you know, it was done. The agents got the story straight from Lulu over the wiretaps. Corridor is reporting back to Flacco. He said, it's been done. And Flacco was very excited. He said, oh, did you do the work, or did someone else do it? And he said, no, one of my accomplices or one of my buddies did it. On June 11th, wiretaps revealed a contract killing in the making. One of their stash houses had been robbed, and they stole drugs and money. Twice that spring, Corridor had followed orders given by his connect. Federal agents recorded Corridor giving all the orders himself this time. The phones were tapped, and there was a lot of talk of a retaliation. You know, go get the gun. Uh, we're going to get even with this guy. They knew who it was, and that's why we had to end the case. It was over right then. SWAT team had just dragged him out of the house, and that was the first time I'd ever come into contact with him. You know, you could hear him on the phone, you hear his reputation. He actually appeared kind of meek. Alejandro Corridor was charged with running a conspiracy to distribute narcotics. The federal government called Corridor's operation one of the largest cocaine and marijuana rings in Middle America. June 13th, 2012. Alejandro Corridor appeared in federal court, the Western District of Missouri, for his sentencing. I remember the prosecutor, Joseph Marquez, telling the judge how cooperative Corridor had been and asking the judge to sentence him to something less than 20 years. His cooperation guaranteed that the death penalty was taken off the table, but nothing else. She put him where she thought he belonged, and she gave him 30 years. Corridor scheduled for release in the year 2042. He will be 67 years old.